from Microbe TV. This is Office Hours for Wednesday, July 12th. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, Daniel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours, Daniel. I'm glad you decided to come back. We just recorded, by the way, um, our weekly clinical update. And I got to learn what's on Daniel's tie, but I think everyone has to guess what is actually on your tie, okay? We'll let people guess. And I want to welcome everyone tonight, uh, especially our moderators. We have so far Tom is here, Barb Mack is here, we have Steph, we have Andrew, and we have Les. And I can tell you, Daniel, that Tom is either in, in Wisconsin or uh, Oregon. Okay. Uh, Barb Mack is in the UK. Steph is in San Francisco. And Andrew is in New Zealand. And Les is in California. We have people all over the place. What do you think about that? Like, that's great. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I'm I'm watching the guesses come in. Somebody already uh, may have gotten it correct, but I won't say because I uh, don't want to spoil it. Oh, look at that. People actually <laughs> actually heard it. All right. So, folks, cue up your questions for Daniel. Uh, you know, it's, it's special to have Daniel around. So uh, make sure you have relevant questions important question. I'm putting a lot of pressure on people, right? Have relevant, just important ask, questions. Just ask whatever. It's like having a conversation, right? Just ask whatever you want, you know? it's I, I'm not judgy, right? It's not going to be like I'm hanging out and I'm like, oh, that question was really not worth my time. No, no, no. Daniel's <laughs> not like that. Daniel and I also, and, and all of us on our shows, we like questions. There are no dumb questions. So uh, just shout it out. Uh, let's see uh, what we have first here. Um, uh, John wants to know what got Dr. Griffin interested in becoming an MD and if ID was always his path or if that interest came later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so John, it was, it was definitely not a straight track. I was, uh, started off as a, uh, marine biology major at university of Miami, very quickly switched over to philosophy and actually my undergraduate degree at U Colorado Boulder. I see someone's here from Boulder was in philosophy. Um, actually studying Mandarin a bit. I was curious about uh, the scientific revolution and, and how the technological revolution happened in the West as opposed to what was going on in Asia. I really wanted to be a Himalayan expedition guide uh, and then somehow ended up in medicine, didn't like it, became a ski bum, went back to medicine, uh, got hooked on research, um, was a primary care doc for about a decade. Then I got my PhD. Then I got interested in infectious disease, but really sort of all over the place. This is uh, something, you know, we have to have another one of those TWIV 1000s, but we'll have it where it's just mm -hmm. like a casual conversation where you can hear the whole story. Well, we could do another live event in New York. What do you think? We should, we should. And then we could do like, you know, big, big, long answers. I mean, we don't need to have the whole crew uh, for another live event. We can have local people. But I also thought it would be fun to get a small theater and have like Carl Zimmer join us, right? And chat. That would be fun. Yeah. Make it more of a chat. That would be great. And then afterwards we can have a reception where he mingles with people, right? That sort of yeah. thing. So I think people would go to that sort of thing, you know, science-based events. Um, the only way to find out is to try one and yeah, uh, yeah. see if it happens. But I suspect people uh, would like to do that. All right. Uh, Pete said, my nephew volunteered for the Janssen JJ vaccine trial. He half guessed he had the vaccine, not, not placebo. There was some discussion earlier about uh, whether placebos are designed if so people <laughs> can't tell whether they have the placebo or the vaccine. I don't think that's the case, Daniel, right? Yeah, so that that's a that's a challenge. I was listening. Well, I was listening. I think it was the most recent where the comment came up. You can't just define placebo in your your own way and say it has to be you know X yeah. Y or it wasn't really a placebo. But um, you know, with the reactogenicity of some of the vaccines, um, people 
seemed to have a pretty good sense and later sort yeah. of confirmed with serology about which group they were in. Um, the, the Janssen J&J vaccine trial was really quite a trial. The fastest enrolled, fastest executed uh, trial with these readiness cohorts. Um, but yeah, people could usually tell which, which they were getting. But more with the mRNA vaccines, um, maybe also with the, the Novavax, maybe not. Uh, the J&J may be the least of the reactogenicity. Yeah, uh, th these anti-vaxxers are saying that uh, a placebo is either water or saline, and Paul Offit saying no, you, it's not. <laughs> it really varies. Those and, might not be. Those might not be good placebos. No, not at all. Although the, the placebo for the polio vaccine trial in 1955 was saline. Okay, um, but there was no adjuvant in the vaccine, so that was fine. You know, so it really depends on on what it is. Yeah, we even talk about when we do like you know not vaccine, but we do pill placebo control. You know, you've got to try to make sure that they look exactly the same even because the color can have a placebo impact. Yeah. So so Andrew says, what amazes me is that open label placebos are supposed to work. Puzzling. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there is the placebo effect. We did, a, we did a paper on twin yesterday. We were talking about a study of microdosing of LSD and... <laughs> Many people uh, felt better, and they they ended up getting the placebo. So the placebo group did better than the LSD group, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, Nicole is in Italy. Super excited to have Dr. Griffin on a live. We've got even got a weather report there, Nicola. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Do you know what viruses the cat infect you with to make you adore them? Just to, <laughs> oh yes, I got it. <laughs> yeah, Rima says that uh, no one can resist cats. You don't have any cats, Daniel, right? You know, at the moment we do not, but periodically we've had cats. We had Chip and Dale when I was little, two of my favorite cats. We had Mishka when I was in college, got eaten by a mountain lion. Um, yeah, no cat, no cats at the moment. We have good friends who have a couple cats. So whenever I'm feeling like I need some cat exposure, I just go over yeah. there. Uh, the paper presented on Twitter showed that people's favorable opinion on vaccines is increasing despite anti-vax. Yeah, I'm just worried because now we have someone who's ostensibly running for president and perhaps against someone who is also anti-vax. I don't know where we're headed in this country. Well, I think that was the encouraging thing about the paper we talked about last time is that people do not like mandates. Uh, Americans seem yeah. not to like to be told what to do. You know, I, I, I always sort of use the example of when I, I get up to like wash the dishes and then someone's like, are you going to wash those dishes? I'm like, well, not now. But <laughs> so um, but people kind of got this idea of traditional vaccines, vaccines they trust. And it was really the mandates and and wanting to know a little bit more about these uh, newer technology vaccines. So I, it, it'll be interesting to see. But to be honest, when I've been in places like uh, West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you're starting to actually see the impact of social media on um, eroding yeah. some of the traditional confidence confidence in the vaccine. So yeah, this is something I think we need to spend a lot of um, time, attention, resources on education. Because if you're educated, if you understand, it's a lot harder for you to be duped by these um, anti-science folks who who have agendas. They're, they're trying to make either make money or they want a political you know, position or whatever it is. But um, you know, if you're educated, you start to see through the, the, the silliness of the arguments. Doreen writes, will you and Dr. Griffin tell us what you envision from a virological and clinical standpoint if and when the U.S. starts deferring on all vaccines in significant numbers? I presume that means not making them mandated. Is that what you would think, Daniel? Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand that. So, Doreen, since you're live, you can clarify. But um, I think what we were starting to say is um, there are certain childhood vaccines. They're, they're on a schedule. 
Um, if anything, certain places like California have moved away from allowing quite as many exemptions. Um, I think that the COVID vaccines will move into routine childhood vac vaccinations going forward. I think where we are with the current pandemic, um, we've talked about, what is it, 97, 98% of folks have some degree of immunity. They've either acquired it from several vaccine doses, mm. they've acquired it from prior infection, um, but it's really the kids coming into the world that need to be a priority uh, because the, the under four crowd um, is at significant risk. Uh, Nicola writes, uh, what's the percent of vaxxed people that develop long COVID after a mild infection? Saw a review article that put that at 2%. If true, that's a huge amount of people. Yeah, that, that's always been a challenge of what percent of people with each different variant, what percent of people unvaccinated, vaccinated, um, what percent of people, no prior infection with prior infection, end up with, with long COVID? And, and part of it is that definition of, so what is long COVID? And we've talked about over time, um, the WHO, a lot of organizations have really settled on, okay, let's, let's say three months because certain people take a little longer to, to get better. Once you get to three months, um, two, three, four percent, kind of where you're suggesting here, uh, those are some of the numbers that we're seeing. But boy, two percent, of a big number is a big number. I mean, you look at America, say about 400 uh, million folks, 2% of 400 million folks is, is a lot of people. Yep, it is. Uh, Elizabeth says, thank you for all you did during the pandemic and continue to do your clinical updates really kept me sane. Oh, Frank is here. Thank, thank you, Frank, for coming. Moderator, haven't seen in a while. Good, good to have you. Daniel, do you still mask? <laughs> no, that, that's a great question. Um, it depends upon the situation. So, um, you know, I was just, I just finished uh, a couple weeks as the uh, attending at Columbia and um, the, the, culture there, the, the guidance there, the clinical practice is still masking at all times in, um, in clinical situations. So mm -hmm. uh, when we would go in as a team, I'm still a big fan of the bedside rounding, um, we would all be wearing at least surgical masks. Uh, certain contexts, we would be upgrading that to the N95 masks. Um, so it, it depends different different circumstances. I will. Uh, so it, it's uh, masking, but but making decisions upon when I'm masking. I still, you know, my preference is to avoid situations where I feel like I would need to put a mask. I, I do my. Um, is my avalanche analogy. You know, people dig these avalanche pits to figure out if they should ski there. If I'm digging an avalanche pit, I ain't skiing there. <laughs> Uh, debunk the funk is on uh, Sunday's TWIV. That's correct. We're recording Friday, and we have um, <clears throat> Dan with us, and we're going to go through the Rogan RFK Jr. Uh, podcast. And you know, it, it's been addressed already by him and by Paul Offit, but we thought it would be also useful for for the TWIV audience to hear it, which is probably a separate, if if not overlapping, audience. So uh, look for that to drop on Sunday. Okay, Dr. Griffin, Puscast 31, TWIV 1016 on Tamiflu Meta. I didn't see any data on days post onset of symptoms that the drug was initiated. Did I miss that? Um, you bring up an excellent point. And that's, you know, th that's the criticism of uh, a lot of these Cochrane reviews, uh, particularly on Tamiflu, is if you pile a whole bunch of studies together, the, the ones with the largest enrollment are just going to um, sort of silence out, overwhelm the, the smaller, even perhaps well done studies. Um, you know, the, the impression if you go through each individual study, if you find data where a person ends up on Tamiflu in the first 48 hours, um, much more persuasive. A lot of these studies, right? By the time the person gets enrolled, the Tamiflu gets started, mm -hmm. you're past 72. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I would say that, you know, you need to be a little more nuanced. The, the, what is the real world efficacy of Tamiflu? Probably not too impressive because how many folks are really getting it within that first 40 hours, but I will share what I thought was an interesting, um, 
program that I was involved with. So it was the United Healthcare Medicare Advantage program. I don't know if people are familiar with this, but um, certain insurance companies have these um, individuals who are on Medicare, but that they pay a certain premium, and now they're on a certain um, private insurance uh, HMO type program. And so during the pandemic, um, Medicare, the UHC Medicare had several million um, of these older high-risk individuals, um, and I was tasked with helping to figure out how we can keep those folks safe. So one of the things we did um, was we had these blue Bluetooth activated boxes in the home so that if a person was felt to have flu within 48 hours, you could just key in a code and out came the Tamiflu. They didn't have to go to the store. They didn't have that kind of a delay getting it within the first 24 to 48 hours. We were doing similar stuff with um, testing for COVID and monoclonals where a courier would run out to the house, drop off that COVID test. Uh, a telehealth would would watch, make sure they were doing it properly because uh, sometimes you need that and it was set up so it was easy for them to connect. Um, and then if they tested positive, you would get the monoclonals that same within 24 hours of a positive test. So I think a lot of our strategies for early treatment with antivirals um, needs to be coupled with some way of addressing the the logistical hurdles. It's mm -hmm. not helpful to give someone an antiviral after the antiviral um, you know, replication phase has ended. Of course, we could make antivirals where it's it's more forgiving, right? <laughs> You can give well, it. That, that, yeah, that would be. Yeah, can you can you get a bigger window window to your antivirals? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. What well, here we go? I wanted you to see. We have a listener from Coxsackie, New York. Daniel, <laughs> is that cool? <laughs> That's awesome. I like. That. And Alina actually is is the is going to be the recipient of my father's microscope, what he used ages ago. And uh, because I, I don't need it any longer, I have to just a, pack a surgeon it up. with a microscope. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Well, you went to at some point in your training, you have to look in a microscope, right? You you do. I always find it hard. I get you know I I don't get seasick on a sailboat, but I get seasick looking through a microscope for you know prolong the prolonged uh -huh. periods of time that were required early in my career. Well, he had a box, a wooden box of slides. You know, all H and E st stained slides of different tissues. I remember I always used to look at them, and then all the way at the bottom there was one with schistosomiasis. He wrote on schistosomiasis. I have to show it to you actually. Sometime. Oh, that's you can see. I mean, it's ancient. It must be you know, <laughs> fifty years old. I don't know. He must have had it here in the U.S. You know, he was a intern and a resident and the surgical mm -hmm. resident. Um, so he spent many years, he spent about 10 years training before he started practicing. So sometime in those 10 years, I would say in the 50s, he did this. So I'm giving my his his microscope to Alina. I just need to pack it up, Alina. I'll get it to you. Don't worry about it. Don't hold your breath, Alina. <laughs> no, no, I will get it to her. I just okay. want to point out, Millie is from China. How cool. Shaman China. Welcome okay. to uh, China. It's, that's cool. Okay. Ni uh, hao ma. Oh, you, you, ni hao ma, right? Yeah. Can you say anything else? Um, yeah, Washful Jungwen Zai Guoyu Urban Ijo Baba Nian Wachutsai Taipei Taiwan. Oh, I'm so impressed. <laughs> now we'll see if anyone can understand any of that. Any of our Mandarin speakers, Ting De Dong Ma? Wow. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if you know, Vincent, but back when I was in medical school, I had studied um, Mandarin for a number of years. I uh, had an aborted trip to teach at Kunming University in China and did translations for patients. But And you also speak Spanish, right? Yeah, my wife would argue with that. She says we have so much trouble communicating in English, it's even worse in Spanish. But <laughs> Well, that's always the case, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Griffin, why is previous cellulitis a risk factor for another one? Hmm. Uh, so that's, that's a great one, Patricia. Um, so it is right. It's, you know, if something happens to you once, um, you know, endocarditis, biggest risk factor for getting endocarditis a second time. Um, you know, it, 
probably with cellulitis is a number of things. So one, interesting enough, we always think about, you know, let's get a family history for heart disease, things like that. But a family history of a specific pathogen infection is about 100 times more compelling for that same pathogen in the future. So part of getting cellulitis is unveiling, unveiling something about your immune mm. system. Uh, the second, probably unveiling something about your general health. Is, is there an obesity issue? Is there a, a perfusion vascular issue? Um, is there a skin issue. Um, but no, that's certainly true that previous cellulitis is a risk factor for another episode. Uh, Kip, who you may remember from our fundraiser last year, Daniel, from San Francisco, he, uh, Kip and Laura were both there. Um, Daniel's tie looks like my dad's socks tied around <laughs> his neck. Okay. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. Kip is And hello. Stopping. Good to see you. He's stopping by tomorrow at the incubator to uh, to visit. Oh, that's uh, great. Rich, R Richard says proteins on bow tie. Okay, that's close, but no cigar. Uh, Silvio Pina, thank you for your support of uh, science communication. We appreciate it. Uh, MN says no one is safe until everyone is safe. Yes, I've heard that quote. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start saying that, Daniel? Was it during the pandemic? Obviously, right. Yeah, I should go back and see like when, you know, there's a couple things like when did I start adding quotations? I think that was spring of 2020. When did I start with the closing? You know, no one is safe until everyone is safe. I think it was pretty early, but I, I'll yeah. go back and check. All right. So Rishaw says antibody bow tie by infectious wearables. I have their herpes B tie. Is that correct, Daniel? That is correct. <laughs> so we have both uh, space filling models and uh, just stick models of the antibodies, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, time. actually, so if you look at it, you can see, yeah, the yeah. stick one. Actually, let's see if I got my finger. Oh, go the other direction. Right about. Yeah, yeah right yeah. there. Yeah. And then, yeah, the other ones. So. Uh, are you afraid of Ebola when you go to Africa? Um, I don't think afraid. Actually, the, the my biggest concern when I go to these places is, um, you know, human safety, safety, um, you know, from violence and things like that. I mean, I feel like as an infectious uh, disease physician, I'm, I'm quite uh, educated in how to keep mm -hmm. myself safe from these things. Um, but yeah, when, when there was the outbreak in West Africa, for instance, um, I was looking into joining the effort. I just was not convinced with the different organizations I talked to that they would be able to guarantee the, the human safety factor. And, and that was an issue. I mean, some of the people that went over there to try to help um, ended up having um, some pretty, uh, pretty bad uh, physical violence experiences. Barb Max says, I'm fascinated by the leprosy cases in the U.S. Where are those people catching it and why does it take so long to incubate? Yeah, that, that was uh, something, um, I guess we mentioned that on This Week in Virology last week. And uh, I have I've had the opportunity, uh, actually this is, this is a chance for another story. So in right around, let's see, mid nineties, I was supposed to go and work at the Masunga Leprosy Clinic in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Um, and if any, anyone remembers right about February, March of 1995, uh, that was when the rebels took the capital of Freetown. So about seven days before I'm supposed to arrive to work at the leprosy hospital for several months, um, I get the only telegram I've ever gotten in my life. Um, and they are actually, uh, the Belgian doctors are fleeing the country um, because one of the ambulances was, fi was firebombed. Um, the rebels took over the compound. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I, I, have a, I have an interest in leprosy that goes back actually quite a way, about 30 years. Um, and um, I've had a chance to... Uh, to spend time at leprosy hospitals um, in, in Africa, in India, and in other parts of the world. Um, the interesting thing is actually how little we know about the transmission of leprosy. If you look at individuals that work in a leprosy hospital, majority of them do not get leprosy. So again, there probably is some sort of genetic um, variability to who can even get leprosy. Um, then there is what we think is a pretty significant exposure. And then leprosy, mycobacterium leprae, is so incredibly slow growing. Um, there are a few people in the world who can cultivate it in um, mouse um, foot pads, uh, but still takes a really long time. So, you know, as we talked about, it can be decades from an exposure until a person actually ends up with, with leprosy. Ian writes, is not the timing of antivirals critical to efficacy, not only in days, but hours? 
so th that's an interesting issue. I mean, as we've talked about, and I, I'll put you know our Paxlovid right up front. We talk about this. the difference in efficacy in getting it in the first three days versus getting it in day four or five. Actually, is only a couple percent difference. Um, so you know, in there, we're not seeing that that hours matter. It's more days matter. Staying within this this certain window of when uh, you're hoping for the efficacy. Um, if you look at certain antibacterials, um, you know, it's hours is the window. If someone is septic, if someone has pneumonia, uh, good good data that. that that hours are actually critical in when the antimicrobial agent is started. Can you talk about common complications of HPV in young men? Um, you know, actually, I think that's a thanks for bringing that up, Patricia. Actually, um, you know, a lot of the focus has been um, on um, on women on cervical cancer, and that was a lot of the push. You know, vaccine that prevents cancer, um, but HPV is implicated in um, in problems in men, not just when they're young, but if people are maybe aware of something that's been the headlines lately, uh, progressing to um, to cancers as they get a bit older. So, yeah, I, I think we we sometimes forget about what a significant impact HPV. HPV has um, across both sexes and actually going into older age. Rach says, I saw a report about deer and COVID today. Well, that, that's been happening for a while. It's yeah, there was something in the there was something in the press recently. There was some more. It was a nice study on it was it was the transmission from people to deer. It was documented uh, deer to deer transmission. Yeah. So deer are quite susceptible. And uh, large, high, high percentages of populations are infected. And they, they don't seem to get very sick either. Yeah, it's interesting. New, usually you would think, right, deer would stay away from people. Uh, I still remember one time I was camping with uh, with Daisy, my oldest daughter. And she, uh, she, she can't see when her glasses are off. So she gets up at night and walks right into the deer. Apparently the deer can't see well at night either. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the deer and humans are quite in intermixed. We have tons around here, so there's lots of yeah. opportunity for interaction. What's the wildest and most confounding ID case you've ever seen to date? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to say, um, you're going to have to listen to This Week in Parasitism where I share them all. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of the cases I've actually shared on there where, where it's a mystery and we're, we're trying to sort it out and then unexpectedly we get the diagnosis. But I think maybe that's my love of some of the parasitic cases is uh, uh, just the sort of exotic presentations. Which vaccines do you recommend for someone who travels a lot? Yeah, so there, there's a couple ways to approach this. And I think one of the things that we just had a publication on was that very few people will go and get medical advice before they travel, right? So you're going to spend thousands of dollars on this trip, but they're not going to spend $99 <laughs> or two ninety five, dollars whatever they're going to spend, to talk to a professional for 20, 30 minutes about, hey, how do I keep myself safe? So, you know, the the bare bones approach, just just maybe this will get you thinking, I should go talk to someone, is go to, um, there's a CDC travel.gov website. You can put in your location and start to see um, potential vaccines, um, potential therapeutics you might want. Um, a lot of us that do this professionally, you know, don't do this at home is what I'm trying to say here, um, we'll use a, uh, a service called Shoreline Travex. Um, and we'll even look specifically, well, where in the country are you going? What season are you going? Um, and so, you know, flu is routine, um, typhoid in a lot of parts of the world, um, hepatitis B vaccine, um, you know, not just because we worry about the sex exposure, but because you might end up interacting with the healthcare system, uh, getting a, a, a needle exposure, maybe that needle or scalpel is not clean the way it should be. Um, you know, we really look at where a person is going. Are they going to be in the meningitis belt? Do they need meningitis vaccines? Are they going to be in a yellow fever area? Or even are they going to travel through a yellow fever? Uh, last time I went to Uganda, I traveled through a place. And then when I show up in Uganda, everyone is being checked for their yellow fever vaccine card. And, you know, if I didn't have that with me, then I might not have gotten into Uganda. Kang wants to know what preparations should be taken now for the next respiratory <laughs> pandemic? Okay, so this is this is great. Um, 
Well, you know, it's all about science, um, science and communication, I'm going to say. So number one, th there's a number of, um, you know, pathogens that we'll be thinking about. You know, we, we say that this coronavirus pandemic we're, we're still sort of working through um, was a shot over the bow. Most people were predicting an influenza pandemic. And as we've talked about, those influenza medications that we currently have are just not really as impressive as we would like them to be. So don't just stockpile Tamiflu and think that that's going to save us. We we could use, we do need to prioritize more research on more effective um, antivirals, um, influenza, coronavirus, et cetera. Um, I think we really made some big steps forward with our vaccine technology, um, but we need um, to be a little quicker on the uptake for testing next time. So we should already be thinking about how are we going to do that? Are we going to have a bottleneck? Are we going to have the CDC saying only our test? Or are we going to basically say, come on, PCR is something people can be doing in their labs. Let's have a quicker way of getting testing. So think about all the different things. Surveillance, so we know it's happening. Testing, so we confirm that it's happening. Um, effective therapy, so we can jump in. Um, think about some of the lessons we learned with convalescent plasma, which might be one of the quickest things we can jump in with. Um, and then the, the vaccine technology. But don't forget, what was the biggest disaster of this pandemic? A lack of communication, a lack of an educated public. You know, if you're educated, you will not be duped. If you're educated, your life expectancy is going to be about 20 years longer than if you're not educated. So I think we need to prioritize education. Continue to listen to Microbe TV. <laughs> we want to educate you. But people are moving away and they're not getting educated. So apparently a few people like the idea of a live show in New York. Elena Elena, sorry, and Lise uh, would both come to a live event, so uh, we'll do it. All right, Silvio Pina, rumors of malaria reaching SoCal. We have a major mosquito problem here in Burbank. Should we start thinking about anti-malaria vaccine or is it overkill? So this is a great question. Um, I, uh, I I realized I recorded a show recently. Um, I thought it was live, but you know I, I need to pay more attention. Um, and it was, <laughs> and it was. Uh, I think it's going to be aired on Cheddar News Twelve with Elizabeth Ashigan. And um, it it really was talking about mosquitoes and you know mosquito vector borne diseases and it, people are sort of waking up to the fact that hey there were just half a dozen um, cases of malaria in um, in Florida there was a case in Texas and what a lot of people probably don't know it's the history of this is malaria for a period of time for a significant period of time was endemic here. In the United States. It was endemic in Florida. It was endemic as far north as Washington, D.C. It was endemic as far west as Kansas. I don't know how many of our listeners grew up reading the Little House of the Prairie books, mm -hmm. um, but there was this whole idea that everyone gets sick and um, you know, I think I think mom is blaming it on, uh, you know, eating watermelon, um, but it actually was malaria. It was people, you know, right along the river getting it. So in a lot of parts of our country, we've got the mosquitoes. We've got the Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, you know, if we reintroduce this, uh, this pathogen, this parasite, um, we can reintroduce. So I, I don't think we're at the point where there's a cost benefit um, weighing in favor of rolling out malaria vaccines. Um, but, you know, I, I do think this is, uh, again, just a, a heads up that we need to pay attention. Okay. Recent paper in Nature. T-cell exhaustion may be the cause of long COVID. Have you heard this, Daniel? Yeah. So I, I saw a little bit of this on, uh, what do we call it, on the social media. <laughs> so, um, you know, there actually is, there's a great paper that I'm going to talk about on the next uh, This Week in Virology. So we've, we've already recorded. We did earlier today um, the This Week in Virology clinical update that'll come out this Saturday. Um, but next Saturday, I'm going to record one. Um, and there's, a, I think it's a Nature Immunology Reviews paper where they, they really go through about a dozen different theories on what might be driving long COVID. Um, and there's sort of this idea that if someone puts out a theory and writes about it, that suddenly it becomes, you know, something. Mm -hmm. um, but we do not understand what causes long COVID. Um, you know, and as a scientist, we want to sort of line up possibilities. We want to also line up what can we investigate? What can we determine um, plays a role? 
doesn't play a role. And then ultimately, as clinicians, we want to know, okay, so if there's evidence behind a certain um, mechanism, what might we able what might we be able to do about this? So I'm going to talk a little bit about this this concept of T cell exhaustion um, driving long COVID. So right. the history the history on this, and uh, you've been, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with this, is that certain chronic infections, certain chronic diseases like cancer, can ultimately lead to T cells becoming exhausted. So T cells starting to express, we call them exhaustion markers starting to lose their ability to be efficacious. Um, you know, one of the things that this would sort of suggest would be that there is a, a ongoing viral activation uh, driving that if that's the trigger of long COVID. We're still not seeing a lot of evidence for that. There's three places, I think now, Stanford, Duke, and Yale, that are doing these Paxlovid trials, uh, sort of the whole idea that if there is ongoing um, viral replication, a prolonged course of an antiviral like Paxlovid might make a difference. Um, we're not seeing any early preliminary data, um, so sort of not making me quite as optimistic. But yeah, th this theory is, is circulating, um, but the reality is we're still trying desperately to understand long COVID, um, and there's a number of trials looking at different therapies, but still still a challenge. I think it's likely to be more than one cause as well, not just exhaustion, maybe cytokine issues and, and autoimmunity and more, right? Well, I think that's what we're starting to realize. We're starting to realize that long COVID is not one disease, that there might be different phenotypes. There may actually be people that move from different phenotypes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, Occam was not a physician. He was not a researcher. It, it usually <laughs> it isn't just one thing. Um, you know, and the thing of science is not to just say, okay, it's this and I know it's this and I'm going to look for confirmation bias. Scientists, the last thing you want to do is get caught up in that game. You've got to be honest. You've got to be humble. You've got to say, I, I want to see the data. Um, I am going to admit that I don't know, and I'm going to um, work on trying to know. Uh, what's the latest on the RSV vaccine for older people? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's going to be, as we talked about, rolled out in the fall. It'll be shared decision making. Um, it'll be something that we'll, we'll be recommending for our most uh, at-risk individuals. I think of my parents in that group. Um, and then as we have more experience, we'll have a better sense of the risk-benefit ratio for lower risk but at-risk individuals. Uh, Lori writes, I have burnt tongue mouth syndrome, small fiber neuropathy. Can this be a viral infection? What is the cause? How long will it last? It's been almost a year. Yeah, so that that's tough. That certainly um, has been described, um, the burnt mouth, a small fiber neuropathy after uh, different viral infections. Um, how long will it last? Um, you know, at a population level, we don't really know. At an individual level, we certainly don't know. Science writes, COVID virus, 29 spikes. Infection can have billions to trillions of virus. Any freight of spike protein should rush to... I can't understand this question. Sorry, I'm going to skip <laughs> over it. Let's go to the next one. How can ED, urgent care, and primary care docs still treat incorrectly? For example, prescribing antibiotics unnecessarily or steroids in the first week. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this is tough, and I think it's it's sort of a call to arms um, for clinicians. We've really got to start asking, how do clinicians stay up to date with the latest treatment? So what do they do? Um, you know, a lot of clinicians, and it does pain me, they read the popular press. They, you know, they hear, you know, oh, steroids, COVID, and then they match. They forget about when, you know, as we've talked about, okay, yeah, steroids in the second week, in individuals, the oxygenation saturation is less than 94%. First week, we're actually doing harm. We're increasing the rate of progression. Um, you know, antibiotics, oh my gosh, what is it? 30, 40% of folks that show up in an urgent care walk out with an antibiotic prescription with some concept that we, we live in a capitalist model. And if we don't give them the antibiotics, they're going to go next door and they're going to get the antibiotics. Um, you know, folks, Physicians, we're a profession here. Um, you know, you can't just bow to the the whims of capitalism. You have a commitment. You took an oath to do what's right for your patient, and your ability to do what's right for your patient requires that you make a commitment to staying educated. So, we're here. We've been doing this for years now. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep reminding, um, you know, clinicians, and we're going to keep talking to patients, 
potential patients as well. So when they have that conversation with the physician, uh, the red flag goes up if the physician is not um, following evidence-based, guideline-based care. Elena wants to know what's one of your happiest, most rewarding moments in, you've had professionally? Oh, clearly joining TWIV, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it, there, there's a reason, Elena, why I sort of bounce back and forth from, from the lab to, uh, to the bedside. And I think it's because I've had these just tremendous moments um, in both settings. Um, you know, it's, it's a daily basis when I, I connect with a patient and I feel like a difference, I make a difference. It's also tremendous when, you know, I have to say like this last couple of weeks when I'm working with the, you know, medical students who just four days ago were medical students and now they're interns, um, just how rewarding to help them uh, make that transition. Um, and then boy, at the, at the bench, I mean, there's been some pretty exciting times, you know, new data, you know, analyzing my uh, flow cytometry data at one in the morning. So. Uh, Doreen writes, adult daughter going to Sarasota for a week in August for a marine project. Lots of time on the water. Should we get malaria prophylaxis? Yeah, so Doreen, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, so I'm going to break this down. You know, what should your daughter do to be safe when she goes to, um, to Sarasota? Um, you know, one of the big things is how do you get malaria? You get malaria by getting bit by mosquitoes. The Anopheles mosquitoes that uh, transmit malaria are night and darkness feeders. Um, so, you know, one of those things, uh, think about the nighttime activities. If you're going to be out after dark, um, use insect repellent. Um, a lot of people use DEET. I'm a little partial towards the picaridin, you know, spraying that on the legs, the ankles, the exposed skin. Um, you know, I don't think we're at the point now with, you know, six cases um, that I would recommend um, malaria prophylaxis, right? You're going to have to start that before you go. You're going to have to take it for a week, you know, three to seven days after you get back. Um, the biggest thing at this point would be uh, just really minimize the amount of uh, malaria um, exposure, vector exposure you might get. And the other reassuring thing, right? So this is uh, Plasmodium vivax. Um, everyone who's gotten it so far has been um, successfully treated. And now that there's an awareness here, if your daughter, you know, starts having fever, starts not feeling well, um, I am sure you're going to demand that they get tested and promptly treated if positive. Hey, folks, we have 283 of you here. We have 118 likes. Please hit the like button, the thumbs up. Helps to make us more visible. Uh, Noir writes, there's a disease in cats called feline infectious peritonitis. At our cat rescue, we use remdesivir off-label to treat it. Now this once deadly infection can be treated. That's cool. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Yeah, I've actually heard about this. So yeah, yeah. I heard, I heard about it at some meetings as as well. Yeah. Uh, Patricia writes in one of his books, Paul Offit says the conventional advice to always finish antibiotics isn't correct. You can fact stop them when you feel better. Agree. <laughs> so th this is a really interesting, and I, and I always you know I always try to tell a little bit of the history of medicine when I'm teaching, and part of it is, is telling you know the history of medicine, not about like oh I used to work 120 hours a week, you know, it's about when I trained. Um, we would tell patients that if they had pneumonia, they needed to take 21 days of antibiotics. And if they didn't take 20 days of antibiotics, we would berate them. Um, now I, I, you know, I've got a list. It's like, you know, my Alcoholics Anonymous calling every patient. Remember when I told you 21 days, I was wrong. You should have only done five. Um, so I think that, um, we are finally learning about, um, durations of antibiotics, you know, and I, I joke about the Constantine units. Those are multiples of seven. Seven, right? Emperor Constantine gave us a seven day week, and we like to tell people to do things in one, two, or three multiples, maybe sometimes four to six of the multiples. The, uh, the carpal units, that's five days. Why five? Why not four? Why not six? Because the number of fingers in a hand. Um, if we were t three toed sloths, we might uh, rein in the antibiotic prescribing. Um, but no, we're hopefully moving in an evidence-based way to what types of durations are associated with um, what types of cure rates and also what types of recurrence. Um, but yeah, the Paul Offit, you don't always need to finish it. You certainly don't need to finish it if you were told to take 21 days of antibiotics for your pneumonia. <laughs> Principal says, Lori Garrett tweeted a story concerning Okinawa COVID hospitalizations going through the roof. Any reason to be concerned? 
Yeah, I, I heard about that. And um, I have to say, you know, right now, just because COVID is not in the newspaper, does it mean that it's not happening? Um, one of my colleagues was manning the urgent care on um, Monday, and they saw 20 patients, four of them were COVID positive. Um, I was just at Columbia, and we had a couple folks with COVID, a um, couple folks I've got in the hospital right now out here on Long Island with COVID. So COVID's still there. Our background death rate is sitting at about 900 a week, background death rate. Um, you know, so... Uh, I think it is worrisome when we hear about places where they're they're having spikes. This this virus is still not settled into this this seasonality that people have talked about, um, and we'll see we'll see what happens. Rob wants to know what is the worst case of fungus you have seen. <laughs> So actually, one of the worst cases is kind of a classic um, Madura foot. I don't know if people are familiar with Madura, but I actually saw a case of Madura foot in India, in Tamil Nadu, southern India, not that far from the town of Madura, where its name came. And what Madura foot is, it can be caused by bacteria or fungi, um, but this was a case basically where the, the foot was being eaten by, by the fungi. And there were these draining uh, tracks, um, sort of the black crystal material, um, really, really horrible. Hmm. Ian writes, are pre and post exposure use of antivirals such as influenza safe and effective and dispensed as per guidelines? So let's see, pre and post exposure. Um, you know, if you if you follow the guidelines, right, and the the guideline for we'll take Tamiflu for instance. Um, I know we'll we'll. I don't know if our our Dr. Krug is listening, or he'll want me to mention Zofluza, um, but. Um, you know, the idea is getting it within the first 48 hours. So if people are more than 40 out, particularly past 72, the guidelines would say there really isn't much of an indication. A uh, person is hospitalized, the risk benefit um, recommendation is to go ahead with the Tamiflu, even, even if you're a little bit outside that window. Uh, but again, we've discussed the evidence. Um, now, there's also uh, the situation where let's say you have a nursing home outbreak um, and folks get, you know, Instead of a dose twice a day, they get a dose renally adjusted once a day for 10 days, um, reducing uh, the risk. So, um, yeah, I think that the, um, the guideline-based dispensing um, use of antivirals for influenza is safe. You know, we've talked about just not as efficacious as I think people might have a sense. So Doreen cl clarifies her earlier statement, when the anti-vax spreads and people stop voluntarily vaccinating. Oh, okay. Yeah, the problem is if if we get rid of mandates in this country, which could happen, right? Um, yeah, it could happen. Under yeah. the right or the wrong administration, right? Yeah. Uh, do you screen all your patients for HIV regardless of risk factors? So, you know, that is a troublesome thing. You know, this, you know, this question about risk factors, we, we really need to start moving away from this concept of, of risk factors because we miss people, we stigmatize people. Um, you know, there, there's a mandate whenever someone goes into an emergency room that they're supposed to be screened. Um, you know, this, this is something we need to do more of. Um, you know, I, I think people don't realize that there's, you know, tens of thousands of new diagnoses of HIV. Um, so I, I think that you should be looking at the population, you know, have you had your HIV test, um, making it more of a normalized than just a targeting, um, you know, this perceived high risk group. I've recently seen two papers suggesting opposite conclusions about T cells waning, any comment? <laughs> <laughs> you know that that's science right i mean science is you get data a number of papers um th there really tends to be this tendency and i've seen more of it where people want to say i read this paper and you can't just read one paper you got to read multiple papers um trying to sort of uh put put you know connect all the dots to try to understand t cells will go down just like antibodies the question is whether you have memory t cells right and not, yeah, and sure. what is what does waning exactly mean, right? Yeah. As we've talked about. Did you see Lex Friedman had RFK on? In his introduction, he recommended Dan Wilson and Vincent Twiv to his viewers. Yeah, I did see that. I wonder how many will take his recommendation. Maybe ten. <laughs> Thousand <laughs> out of the million who are who have already watched that video. I don't. I don't see why he would have had him on. I put a comment 
to one of his Instagram posts where he said he was going to have RFK on. I said, why? Why? He's going to give misinformation about vaccines. What's the point? Well, the point is he's going to get him millions of views, right? Yeah, that's a problem, Vincent. And that, that really is. And, um, you know, there, there's sort of this way, uh, you know, media works where, you know, something that gets clicks, something that gets views, sells advertising dollars. Um, you know, there, there is a capitalist, uh, side to misinformation and there's a lot of money. There's, there's billions over on that side. And so, uh, Yep. You know, it's going to be up to people. You know, do they want to be able to look in the mirror? Do they want to be able to sleep at night? Um, you really have to be careful because when you take those those dollars, when you give air to misinformation, um, people die. People get sick. People lose loved ones. Uh, Lise wants to know what's the status of the oral remdesivir trial? I'm still waiting uh, for some results. And when um, and when I've got them, I will share them. Uh, Dr. G, I'll never forget the few episodes you did from your car outside the hospital. Yes. Yeah, I, I remember those. Um, yeah, those were really long days early on, and I would come out to the car, and I would do these episodes, and I was doing them in the stairwell, sort of like trying yeah. to pack stuff in there. Um, yeah. GRR writes, can people, women over 50, get HPV vaccine? Why is it discouraged? Plenty of women over 50 get new partners, so why not allow a vaccine that might prevent a variety of cancers? Yeah, that's actually a, so it's a good question. And let me try to put it in, you know, where do the recommendations come from? What are people thinking? And so, um, you know, you could say, what if I went ahead, I got pap smears, maybe I had a limited number of partners, maybe I said, hey, I may not have had HPV, here I am 50, and I'm in a period of my life when I may be having new sexual partners, why can't I get the benefit of the vaccine? Um, and the studies, you know, that, that we um, based the approval and the licensing on were based upon an HPV naive population. So there's sort of this idea that, boy, by the time you've reached 50, and kind of you can hear it's getting a little judgy here. Ah, oh, you probably already have it. So what are we doing? Um, but why not if a person was was interested? It's a licensed vaccine. So you can definitely have this conversation with your uh, provider. MK writes, I'm in the trial for the RSV vaccine by Bavarian Nordic. They're using the MVA vector. Any chance it'll give a boost for smallpox? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's a great, what, what do you think, Vincent? Modified vaccine, Ankara, sure, why not? Yeah, yeah it's a vaccine it'll have vector. Some of the other. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. would. Yeah, for sure. I heard on the news that Wash U they have a machine to detect aerosol SARS-CoV-2. I think you mentioned that on an update, didn't you? Yeah, I think I just sort of uh, like a side reference to it. So yeah, so it's this really interesting um, technology. And it, it makes, you know, I got to say, like when this actually goes from just like a presentation at a conference, which I think is all it's been shared, like a little news thing mm -hmm. was sent out there. Um, but the whole idea is within two minutes, this technology actually has the air go through. And then um, I think it's a luminosity, um, but it actually can let you know if there's a particular virus in the air. Um, so sort of exciting uh, technology. You could potentially have these like, you know, as people are entering a venue, sampling the venue, rather than getting that phone call, you know, the next day, oh, yeah, so sorry when I had dinner with you, I was breathing COVID on your face or SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> uh, Dr. Griffin, have you heard of COVID causing hand tremors? Yeah, and unfortunately, um, I've, I've seen a number of patients um, that either develop it acutely or more often they end up coming my way, you know, a few months later, they're having uh, these new onset tremors that they didn't have before. Um, you know, and, and a number of them are, are younger, where it just doesn't seem like it would make sense for it just to be a coincidence. But uh, yeah, we're certainly seeing um, hand tremors. Ian writes, uh, are hospitals, medical clinics, and aged care homes being renovated and built to improve natural and mechanical ventilation? Example, safe, openable windows, mechanical ventilation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, not not enough. There was, there was a huge um, program to provide funds um, for hospitals, clinics, um, you know, areas where vulnerable people are schools, right? Um, and I, I think we've shared some of the some of the studies and most of this money was not used. Most of these facilities have not taken advantage of upgrading. Uh, but th this isn't just COVID, right? This is going to help us with with a lot of respiratory pathogens. 
uh, Kip says, uh, with respect to those PTs who go south, patients who go south at COVID week two, is it more of an extension of the illness and not a fork in the road? Do I have this right? Yeah. So, you know, we, we put out a paper. We It was a motley crew in early uh, spring 2020 describing the different stages of of COVID to the disease. So the first week is this period of viral replication, sore throat, body aches. You, know, you feel like you're fighting off a virus. The second week is when we see what, you know, some of us refer to as the cytokine storm, the early inflammatory, the pulmonary phase. And the virus is on the way down, but the immune response is ramping up. Um, so, you know, it, it is it is part of the illness. Uh, there's then a third, a fourth week, and for some people, an extension past there. Um, so, yeah, it's not a, not really a fork in the road. It's just a level of, um, of inflammation that can get triggered. Now, 80% of folks, and this has been kind of from the beginning, um, really don't have much of a second week. But about 20% of folks have a pretty significant second week, uh, symptom-wise. But if you can jump in early with antivirals, if a person is, is vaccinated, um, then the chance of that second week being severe enough that they require medical care, go to the ER, require oxygen, is going to be um, you know, reduced by over 90%. We're still 100 below our listeners. We've got 300 listeners, 190 likes. Come on, folks, hit the like button, please. They're listening, but they don't like us, Vincent? What is I that? I guess not. I guess not. Elena writes, I was born in 81. <laughs> what polio vax did I get? You got OPV. From 63 to 2000, you would get only OPV uh, in the U.S. Although, Daniel, if, if you had certain medical conditions, could you have gotten IPV during that period instead of OPV? 1981. I would have to look. When did IPV become available in the U.S.? Do well, you know? it became, we switched to IPV in 2000. 2000. But, yeah, um, but I guess it would be when was it licensed? Like, could you have had an option, you know, if you had a doc that said. Oh, in 55, it was licensed. So okay. it could have so, been still, uh, if a doc said, well, you have, a, if you're immunosuppressed, we don't want to give you an infectious vaccine, right? Then, yeah, then you could have been IPV. But OPV, yeah, as you point out, was standard until about 23 years ago. So you probably got OPV, Elena. Yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah. I, I remember when I used to go see, I tra started traveling a bit when I was, well, younger. Um, and I they used to give OPV boosters when I would go to certain parts of the world. Like when I was traveling, I was headed up to the Silk Road and Pakistan and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. places like that. Besides Dan Wilson, it would be a good idea to include Susan Oliver. Uh, yes, uh, we won't have time to get her but I will reach out and get her another time because I don't think you can do it too many times. Uh, to do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you. Uh, do you think there's evidence for different blood types being differently susceptible to COVID? Yeah. So Craig, this has gone back and forth, right? Um, and I think that more recent, there was a study where um, there was actually seemingly a difference in, um, you know, in, in different subtypes as far as susceptibility to COVID. H&E slides bring flashback to dental school. Also wondering if oral molnupiravir is on the horizon for use in the U.S. Yes. So, um, yeah, H&E slides. Um, I, I actually, not only, you know, in, in my training, but even when I was doing some of my publications on B1 cells, I was making my own H&E slides. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, molnupiravir is is being used. So this is molnupiravir HBR. I'm trying to think if, let me take a look here. I mean, mol is an oral medication to begin with, right? Yeah, but is there something about this HBR that I'm not yeah. familiar with? HB little r, let's see. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, molnupiravir is available in the U.S. It is limited use, and part of it is a lot of us are not particularly impressed with the the efficacy. Um, but it's an easy lift, right? As we've talked about, yeah, yeah. no renal adjustment, no drug drug interactions, but just you know, not not a lot of efficacy. Doctor Griffin, is there a lake or body of water parasite that you can just rigorously towel yourself off to prevent? I saw a clip <laughs> from a few years ago that Vinny referred to you doing that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, uh, so John, I will share the story. 
Um, my um, my wife's uh, sister, Juliet, uh, married married Tim. Tim is in the uh, State Department. Um, actually, my wife's dad was career State Department, so you know, sort of falling not far from the tree. And they end up posted in different parts of the world. And one of the places they were posted in was Lalongwe, Malawi. So while we're there, there was this whole discussion about uh, gathering up the troops, getting in the cars and driving um, over the range to Lake Malawi, the, we call the <laughs> Calendar Lake, right? 365 miles north-south, 52 miles wide. Um, and um, I'm explaining to my kids about, you know, I don't know when you go there, it's going to be hot, it's going to be beautiful, but there's schistosomiasis in that lake. And so, you know, as much as you're going to want to go in, I'm, I'm not very excited about having you go in. And we got there and it was beautiful. And there were some local kids, you know, about 100 feet away bathing. So uh, not really convinced that this was was safe, very much like I had warned the kids, but it was just so hot. And what did we do? We all went swimming. Now, what I, I will say is that uh, the penetration of the parasite of the cercaria is not while you're in the water. It's when you get out of the water and as your skin dries. So my theory was that when we got out of the water, if we toweled off briskly, we would not get schistosomiasis. <laughs> That's your theory. Yeah. And obviously it worked because you're fine, right? <laughs> sure, sure. And, and I will say there was a lifeguard there at this lake. So I went over and I asked the lifeguard. I said, so you're a lifeguard here. Do you know how to swim? He's like, no, I don't know how to swim. I was like, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, I watch. And when the crocodiles get too close, I yell. And you're supposed to run out of the water. <laughs> Great. Uh, Sundari Ann writes, my father, 97, in a nursing home, paralyzed by strokes, day three of COVID. He's on oxygen, steroids. He couldn't breathe. He has pneumonia. He has blood thinner. Should he take Paxlovid? Um, 97. So I'm, I'm not seeing any reason here why he shouldn't. So if he's on day three of COVID, um, you know, I, I think that this is a situation where the, the benefits of antiviral would, would make sense. Um, you know, you want to you go through and figure out exactly what medications are on. And the other is this is potentially a time, you know, where you might be able to jump in with remdesivir. A lot of nursing homes will, uh, will allow access to IV antivirals. So, uh, the, yeah, I'm the, very sorry, Sundari. Are the blood thinners an issue with Paxlovid? So it depends which blood thinner he might be on. Some of the direct oral anticoagulants can have some interactions. So you want to want to run through and, and yeah. look and see what that is. So yeah, you want to look at kidney function. You want to look at medications. Um, yeah. Oh, here is another one from her. I asked the doctor to start him. He agreed, though reluctant, because he takes blood thinners, though the lowest dose. Okay. Uh, MN wants to know, does vigorous exercise immediately after a vaccine affect the efficacy of said vaccine? Yeah, so I've actually seen there's a little bit of, of data on the impact of um, of physical activity um, surrounding. There's also a whole thing about making sure you're well rested when you go in for your vaccination. Um, I don't think, you know, we're going to see any significant. Um, so, you know, if you want to go ahead and work out afterwards, I usually don't tell my patients not to. Could deer be vaccinated by bait or dart gun? How about people by dart gun? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could vaccinate deer, but uh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, it's an interesting thing is do we start vaccinating the deer? I mean, and then you've got to sort of ask the question, and this is good. This goes back to why are we vaccinating the deer? As, as you mentioned, Vincent, right? The deer tend not to get very sick. So are we vaccinating them because we think vaccines protect them against infection and transmission? Are we going to vaccinate them every three months to keep them mucosal, antibody levels up? Uh, mm -hmm. So you got to really sort of ask yourself the question of what is your goal with the vaccination? Yeah, I mean, there's little evidence that it comes back to people from deer at any measurable level, but um, you know, there are 30 million deer in the U.S. <laughs> That'd be a lot of vaccinations, but not impossible. Uh, Doreen, thank you for your support of science communication. Um, hoping there's an upside to my two skin diseases through autoimmune plus high normal white cells, overactive immune system. Could it be protective against viruses like... SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, we sort of talk about, you know, autoimmunity being your immune system is over, but rather than it being overactive, it might be more of a, a dysfunction, might not be functioning as, as well as we would like. So yeah, not, not sure. Uh, John writes that chronic wasting has been now confirmed in Florida deer. <laughs> on a, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, just this week I heard about that. So, Well, it's another example. We should be alert. Who knows what the threat is, right? But Yeah, and I think there was this issue that, um, you know, and I think maybe on uh, the podcast we talked about, you know, ticks can take enough of a blood meal that could they potentially like transmit it, you know, like uh, particularly when, you know, a deer or somebody is, is eating something and ends up crunching down a uh, blood filled, uh, prion filled uh, tick. Uh, Dan wants to know, was the etiology of encephalitis lethargica that overlapped with 1918 flu pandemic ever determined? You know, I don't know. I, I remember a discussion about this, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, not sure I could say. I mean, you know, people probably need to realize, maybe this has come up in sort of the, the recent anti-vax stuff, is if you go back and read, um, you know, the, the flu pandemic book by John Barry, what, what's that called? The Great Influenza? Yeah, the Great Influenza, right. Um, you know, when the flu pandemic of 1918 was circulating, people did not know it was a flu. They did not know it was a virus. It was just a disease, right? And so, um, you know, you had a lot of people believing it was <laughs> Pfeiffer's bacillus, right? They thought it was a certain bacillus. That's right. They thought it was That's bacteria. Right. So, um, you know, really hard, you know, you, you have this massive um, pandemic. You have people developing this syndrome, encephalitis, uh, lethargica afterwards. Um, we also didn't have as great record keeping because there was a lot of mm. denial for a number of reasons, right? Because it's 1918, 1919, there's a, there's a war going on. No one wants to really talk about um, the fact that we might be in a compromised situation. Um, so yeah, this, this would be a very hard uh, connection to really establish. Oh, didn't you know that the 1918 pandemic was caused by the flu vaccine? That we had yet to invent? Amazing. And does he incorporate time machines in this theory? <laughs> I, um, Let's see here what do we have. Oh, this thing jumped. There was a question here. All right. Um, malaria did more to defeat the British Army than anything. More than 50% of Cornwallis's forces in Yorktown were out of action. That's uh, here in the, in the Revolutionary War, right? Yeah, so that that's kind of amazing. I think when um, you know, so my son Barnaby uh, was down in Yorktown with uh, Jessica, my wife, and um, you know, it, up until really recently, diseases were the main things that um, won and lost wars. So, okay, uh, what order would you prefer COVID treatments of this list? Paxlovid, remdesivir, convalescent plasmid, molnupiravir. Am I forgetting anything? Yeah, so John, you, you you've got them. You've got the list here. So the first week, right? We're talking here about treatments for the acute um, viral replication period. So um, you know the the best efficacy, easiest lift here is going to be Paxlovid number one, about 88, 89 percent reduction. Remdesivir close second at 87 percent reduction, um, but again the heavy lift of getting IV access. Uh, Maldipiravir is, is thrown in there and we're a little bit um, not as impressed by its efficacy. And remember, the approval for convalescent plasma, the recommendation for convalescent plasma is immunocompromised individuals in the first week with no other options. So that really puts it at the tail end. Um, would, where did this go here? I just hear, would a virus cause a perforated septum? Would any virus cause a perforated septum? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good. That's a good question. I mean, the answer is probably yes, but can I think of one off the top of my head? Uh, I'm definitely thinking of the the virus in Leishmania, but it's doing it probably because it's in the Leishmania, so it's getting a little mm -hmm. help from its friend. When should I get my 86 year old mom boosted? She's had three of the first gen COVID vaccines. So this has come up a few times, and I think it's important. Um, all of the vaccine companies, right? So Novavax, Moderna, 
um, Pfizer, BioNTech, um, or BioNTech, however we ever <laughs> figure out how to pronounce that word or that name, um, have been tasked with creating um, updated variant-specific vaccines um, this fall. Now, they're going to be XBB vaccines. Um, we fingers crossed that when they actually hit the market and are out there, they're actually going to produce um, neutralizing, generate neutralizing antibodies for whatever um, variant is circulating at that time. Um, we're thinking it's going to be about October, early November when that um, happens. So that'll be the question. If they get it right, um, then an 86-year-old uh, mom um, would, would probably uh, be a candidate for the end of October, early November boost. Uh, Ian wants to know, how pervasive is passive smoke and worsening viral infections in the very young? Yeah, so I've actually been seeing a bit of literature on this lately about the impact of, you know, bad quality air, right? I mean, maybe it's getting more media attention with all the smoke here in the in the Northeast. Um, yeah, so it, it, this is kind of a, a question, almost situational, like how pervasive. Um, it's going to be different settings, right? And so if you're in a setting where um, the child is exposed to passive smoke, um, but if you're in a setting where you know people are not smoking, so this is going to vary in different parts of the country, different demographics, different socioeconomic situations. Um, what was a question here about ticks? Where did it go? <laughs> where is the tick... Oh, they they wanted to know if you've seen an uptick <laughs> <laughs> with a seeming longer and more extensive tick season. Are you seeing a corresponding increase in tick-borne diseases? An uptick. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That was well. Um, so you know, here as people may know, the the Long Island, the tri-states are stretching out to the Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket region. I mean, this is like the home of a lot of tick-borne diseases. Uh, Lyme disease from up there in Lyme, Connecticut. Uh, now people are starting to hear about Babesia. We've got Ehrlichia. We've got Anaplasma. Um, we've got Starry. We've got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We're not even in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and this is the time of year when people are outside, particularly like the bad golfers who end up in the fescue. Um, so we, we are seeing not only an uptick in the uh, number of tick-borne diseases, but we're also seeing an expansion in the geography of places affected by the tick-borne diseases. Okay, a follow-up question on malaria. Is there anything visible at the bite level and time to rush to treatment or does one just get sick after a few days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it can take a few days. It can take a little bit longer. All depends on which subspecies of Plasmodium. But yeah, you you won't know right away. Um, you sort of, fortunately, kind of have to wait and see what happens. Uh, Dr. G, have you ever been to Sweden? I've heard, but don't know if it's true that to get an antibiotic, you practically have to be at death's door. And I think even if you are at death's door, all you get is penicillin. <laughs> <laughs> so. Great. Alina, thank you for your contribution to science education. Uh, Daniel, breaking bad news is not taught in med school. Do you have a sort of method of breaking bad news? Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully they are starting to do a better job at medical school of, of getting uh, the students to be interacting with patients right up front. And I think I mentioned, I'm a big fan of bedside rounds where when we're going to talk about something, we're going to talk about it with the patient in front of the patient, um, you know, and hopefully mentoring what it's like um, to go through that experience of, of having to tell a patient, hey, those results are back. This is what they are. They're not good. Um, so, you know, the, the method I think is be honest. Um, don't say it's all going to be okay because it's not going to all be okay. Um, and I think be sincere, be caring, connect with your patient, have a relationship with your patient so that when you are breaking the news, hmm. uh, this isn't just a stranger. This is someone that you've connected with, someone who you've developed trust with. Um, and it does not take a tremendous amount of time, but it does take time. Uh, I've gone over, Daniel. Can you can you hold on till 930? Would that be fair? I can Good. hold on just a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're cleaning the sewers where I live in the UK. There may be sewage backing up. I got oral polio vaccine when I was six, but I missed the final booster. Am I at risk? <laughs> this is what is wrap your alley, Vincent. What do you, what do you think? Well, if you didn't get the full series, you should finish it for sure. Right. 
yeah. that's our that's our recommendation across the board. If you haven't gotten your full series, go ahead, finish it off. Um, and maybe just the fact that there's, you know, polio is in the press is alerting you to the fact that you've been, uh, you know, living without that full protection. So go go right ahead, finish off your vaccine series. Okay, Dr. Griffin, do you recommend getting shingrix after having shingles? How long after recovery before getting it? So Alexandria, I do recommend getting um, shingrix after having shingles. Um, and it's going to be a question of uh, letting you recover, waiting a couple weeks till you're recovered. Um, you know, some people take longer to recover, and I'm usually going to wait a little bit longer till I know that a lot of the inflammation has settled down. Um, but no, there's there's data, right? We, we talked earlier on is, you know, having cellulitis is a risk factor for having cellulitis. Having shingles, you can still have shingles again. Um, so uh, there is data that, um, you know, it's a benefit to going ahead with that vaccine. Seems to me you've traveled far and wide. Any places you've yet to explore and would like to? <laughs> well, there's, you know, Vincent, there's only one state in the U.S. I have never been to, and it's Alabama. So at some point I got to got to go to Alabama. Okay. Um, you know, and <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> two, two things on my list, it actually came up this weekend, is Egypt. I would like to spend time in Egypt and see the pyramids. And I have not spent a lot of time in the Arab world, so. I would like to spend more time there. Have, I have, have a friend to... in uh, in Kuwait, and I asked him about visiting. He's nothing here to visit. You shouldn't come. <laughs> <laughs> Kuwait. Have you been to Vietnam? Uh, I have not been to Vietnam. That would be on the list. You've been to China, right? Uh, I've been to China about half a dozen times. Wow. Thailand, Cambodia. I, uh, I uh, am going to China in November. I'm looking forward. I haven't been. Oh, fantastic. Uh, what would be your first thought if someone's hemoglobin levels keep dropping? No cancer, bone graft tests haven't shown much, mid-50s. <laughs> um, so hemoglobin keeps dropping. Um, I'm thinking it's bone biopsy tests haven't shown much. Um, yeah, that's going to be a tough one. That's going to actually require kind of that whole evaluation. Is it a is a hemoglobin um, mm -hmm. dropping because it's a production issue? Is hemoglobin dropping because of destruction issue? So you want to sort of understand the dynamics there. Once you understand if it's a production or a destruction issue, then you kind of go down each of those different pathways. In TWIV 1000, I learned that dengue brought you into medicine. When it, Where it's endemic, how many have not had asymptomatic or mild infections? Mosquito bites are inevitable in Thailand, Thailand, for example. Sorry. Thailand. Thailand. Yeah, you know, speaking of dengue, I thought this was really interesting, right? I, I shared that I had my my two dengue infections, right? My my first dengue infection when I was supposed to be teaching in uh, in uh, in China in uh, Kunming, mm. um, and a second infection when I was hanging out in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Um, you know, and we always have this idea with dengue that it's that, that's that second infection, that antibody de dependent enhancement. Um, but there just was a series published in um, GeoSentinel data where it was actually the majority of the severe dengue requiring hospitalization were in people. First time IgM positive, IgG negative dengue infection. So, um, really interesting. I think there's a lot that we say about dengue, um, but we probably need to actually look at the data. Any exercise resumption timeline after testing positive and being treated with Paxlovid? Um, you know, it comes down to an individual level and how they're feeling. Um, you know, the sort of the days of bed rest are, are behind us. And now it's a question of, you know, trying to continue to do uh, a degree of activity that you're comfortable with, not necessarily overdoing it. Um, but, you know, once you get through a couple of weeks um, of sort of, you know, doing what you need to do, uh, then I think it makes sense to start ramping that back up. Look who's here, Susan Oliver. <laughs> Hello, Susan. So we're, we're recording Friday at 3 p.m., and um, if, if you'd uh, like to join, if you can join, shoot me an email at vincent at microbe.tv and uh, we'll work it out. That's great. We'd love to have you on. All right. Um, Polio Pete writes, Dr. Griffin, patient on, you got it. I can't read it, uh, Daniel. Paxlovid or Pat remdesivir? Patient on diltiazem and losartan, Paxlovid or remdesivir. So I'm going to do this in real time, Vincent. I am going to go to the uh, Liverpool <laughs> COVID interaction checker. So Liverpool 
COVID medication interaction. Okay, so people see this is going to take a little bit of time, uh, particularly if you can't type. Um, so here's my liver pool COVID-19 interaction. Um, why didn't it go to my really nice one that I like? Drug interactions, interaction checker. Okay, so now I will start by, you know, my first choice, right? We want an easy lift. We're going to click on the Nermatrelvir. And now we're going to say, okay, what about diltiazem? So um, I'm on this page, covid19-druginteractions.org forward slash checker. Um, and I will start to type in diltiazem. I click on diltiazem and it says um, potential interaction. Allows me to click on it and get a little more information. Um, diltiazem is metabolized by CYP3A4, a moderate inhibitor of CYP3A4. Uh, Co-administration may increase the diltiazem concentration, uh, so they recommend a dose reduction of 50%. So, okay, so far so good. We can just drop that diltiazem dose by 50%. Uh, let's see what happens with our low sartan. So I get rid of diltiazem. I click on low sartan. Weak interaction. So here what I'm going to say um, is drop your diltiazem dose in half, continue your low sartan, Go ahead with Paxlovid. Wow, look at that real-time consult from Sam. <laughs> you saw it in action. You saw the sausage being made. Yeah, not that hard, right? Well, you know what to do, you know? <laughs> okay. Don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> Call your doctor. If one uses Cyclopyrox 1% every day for years, wouldn't there come a time that the fungus gets stronger, making the Cyclopyrox ineffective? Yeah, I don't think stronger is the right word, but, you know, is there a potential to select for resistance um, if you use something for a very long period of time? And yeah, that, that's always the biggest concern we have is that um, if people are using um, an antimicrobial for a long period of time, is there, you know, you're putting selective pressure on the microbe. Uh, if a Lyme infection goes untreated for a year, will the pathogen be cleared or might treatment still be required? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a great question, right? Because we see these consults all the time where someone goes and they see their primary care doc and they say, oh, as part of my routine physical, they did a Lyme test and it came back as positive. Um, and then they come our way. Um, you know, and we sort of go through, are you, are you okay? Do you have any symptoms? Um, and it's not really clear that you, you need to treat someone. You need to treat just a blood test. Um, so yeah, um, I, you know, I, I suspect that probably more often than not, a lot of infections, even Lyme, are cleared without us doing anything other than keeping our hands in our pockets. Spar had five Modernas, got COVID, diagnosed with long COVID. Would getting the sixth vaccine when it's available provide any benefit vis-a-vis -vis lessening long COVID symptoms? Yeah, so Spar, to kind of lay this out, um, you know, we, we noticed this, um, you know, right when the vaccines first came out, right? So we had a, a number of healthcare workers who got COVID early on, had long COVID. I was taking care of um, a number of these patients. They were sort of split. Some of them got the vaccines. Some of them wanted to wait. Um, you know, we noticed a certain percent. Um, and then this was studied later on. So I can give you kind of the percent. So, you know, something about, about 35% or so were feeling better after the first dose picked up another 15, 20% with the second dose. Third dose picked up about 2% more. So there seemed to be this diminishing return. So if you've already had five Moderna vaccines, you've got long COVID. Um, you know, if you sort of follow those numbers, um, the suggestion would be getting another vaccine, you know, we're probably talking about a one or two percent potential impact. Um, you know, as we're starting to see, maybe the vaccines correct the way our immune response um, reacts. Um, we're starting to get a little bit away from the idea that it's clearing remnant virus. Um, so, you know, is it a, is it a bad thing to try? No. Um, did I just remove the potential placebo benefit by giving you all this science? Um, if I did, I apologize. <laughs> I want to go back to Susan Oliver. I realize she's in Australia, so. 3 p.m. Eastern is not going to work for you, but email me anyway, and we'll come. We'll get you on another time because people have been asking for you here, Susan. So uh, uh, we we'd love to do that. Okay, back to questions. 
Uh, we're almost done, Daniel. Okay. Almost done. Just want to see if there's anything more. Oh, would love to see a TWIV epitope or office hours summarizing what we have learned these past three years about viral-related immunology. Yeah, <clears throat> that would be good. I'm not sure it's over yet. Also, I think a lot of the science is just kind of churning out. So really, <clears throat> in the next yeah. year, we're going to have a lot. Um, hopefully, people will maintain their interest so that when all this stuff gets published and, and comes out, um, people are still reading it. Uh, what's your opinion of the involvement of the dermodex mite in acne, rosacea? How would you treat? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't have any great opinion um, okay. on, on the, yeah. Polio Pete wants to know, does thalassemia minor protect against malaria? The, the thought is that there's some protection, and that was uh, one of the drives for the, th the selection of thalassemia um, minor. Oh, this is a good quote. Panama Canal was dug with a microscope. Ronald Ross. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a great quotation, um, and I think very much true. Is there any cure for Chagas or anything you can take post-exposure so it gets completely eliminated early, like with HIV? Yeah, so, so Bully, there are a couple treatments for Chagas disease. Um, and, you know, we've looked at, um, you know, early treatment of Chagas disease. We've also looked at late treatment of Chagas disease. So I'm going to start with late. I'm going to start with the bad news. Um, and, you know, it was not really clear um, in, it was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about half a dozen years ago. Not really clear that late treatment um, with some of these medicines that are kind of hard to tolerate were really having um, the impact that we thought they were going to have. Um, but we do think early treatment, um, you know, not post exposure, but early treatment of acute infection um, has an impact. March, thank you for your contribution to science communication really appreciate it let's see anything else thank you ian for your contribution how immunosuppressed does a b-cell depleting therapy make one of proposed sars-cov-2 and covid-19 yes yeah, so we've actually had some problems i mean so some of the b-cell depleting therapies um like rituximab right um you know the person does not have um B cells. They, they might not have antibodies if they got this um, before antibodies were generated. Um, and then some of these individuals are so immunocompromised that they, they fail to clear um, the virus. So we've actually had a couple of case reports about patients being on a combination of antiviral and when the monoclonals were effective. Um, so it could be pretty significant. So Sundari called the nursing home, canceled Paxlovid, will ask for remdesivir. Thank you. I was crying, thinking I could not contact you. Then I saw the show was on. Thank you. Well, there oh, you go. Sundari, there. thank you. You helped someone. Um, let's see. What are your thoughts on the Milwaukee protocol for rabies treatment? Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with this, um, Vincent, but <laughs> the story was there was a, a young lady in, um, in Milwaukee who uh, developed rabies. We, we think it was bat versus dog rabies. That may be important. Um, and they introduced this protocol, um, you know, N of one, I think that's important, um, where they put this, um, this woman in a coma, um, they later brought her out. She survived, right? This is, you know, a, a disease where we think of 100% mortality. Um, when I was spending time in um, India, um, I was reviewing with some of the researchers there. They had tried to repeat the Milwaukee protocol, you know, many, many times without success. So, you know, it's really tough when you have an N of one. Was there something about bat rabies versus dog rabies? Um, was there just something about this particular individual? Um, the Milwaukee protocol has not really spread to be something that, that changes um, our options for uh, treating rabies in general. So the big thing with rabies, right, is get vaccinated ahead of time, um, deal with the reservoirs, the dogs, et cetera. Any update on Evusheld replacement? Uh, so far, no. So far, we're without. All right. That's it for your questions, Daniel. I want to thank you for joining me tonight. I'm going to let you go, and I'm going to wrap up this podcast on my own. Th Everybody say thank you to Daniel. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. 
That's an order, I guess. Thank you so much, everyone, and, and be safe. Good night. Good night. I just took myself out of it, too. There you go. All right. Thanks, everybody. We have reached the end of the questions. Um, and I got through all of Daniel's and um, kept them longer than I had promised, but I wanted to get through all of your questions. Um, and since there aren't uh, any, any more, this was great. We had almost uh, 300 people tonight. I think that's a good time uh, to end this episode. Look at all the thanks for Daniel. That's great. Uh, so Daniel's, of course, always willing to come on, and perhaps we'll have him back in six months or so. Now, let me tell you the schedule. Next week, we have Q&A uh, with A and V. That's July 19th. Uh, and then the following week, we go back to office hours. I have a special guest for you who you're going to love. It's probably not someone that most of you know. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you will enjoy that guest. So until then, folks, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I want to thank all of the moderators. The whole team was here tonight. Let's see. Oh, except for Vanity. We had Les. We had Steph. We had Tom. We had Barb Mack. We had Frank. We had Andrew from New Zealand. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And as always, uh, until next week, next week, once again, 8 p.m. Eastern Wednesday will be a Q&A with a advance. It's cool that uh, Susan Oliver was on here tonight, right? Uh, so we'll get in touch with her. I didn't know she, she listened. Get in touch with her and get her on to TWIV. That'll do it for another Office Hours. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Have a great week. Good night.